You are listening to part two of our Inside U Miami Medicine episode with Dr. David Scorton, President and CEO of the AAMC, and Dr. Allison Whelan, Chief Academic Officer of the AAMC. Please enjoy this fascinating conversation. It really sets up the next question uh, very nicely. Uh, David, going back to the issue of DEI, WMC released uh, its uh, uh, core competence, competencies uh, for DEI. And, and the question is, why do we need that? And how, why is that important uh, for training the f future physicians? I wish we could devote a, a whole episode of your wonderful podcast to this question because even that wouldn't be enough time, but I'll, I'll give it a shot. <clears throat> so first of all, uh, it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't have uh, almost no uh, American Indians or Alaska Natives in medicine. We shouldn't have barely any black men in medicine. Yeah. Um, it's just not right. Sure. So that's a justice issue. Secondly, is an efficacy issue. The private sector has shown us in uh, research in uh, social sciences and business schools around the country that diverse teams make better decisions. Mm -hmm. That's right. There's less groupthink. There's less, uh, oh, yes, boss, uh, whatever you say. Right. Um, and um, so why wouldn't it make sense to do it? Because it'll be better. Thirdly, there's quite a bit of research that shows that if there's some concordance between the background, demographic background of the physician, and the demographic background of the patient, better things happen, better things happen. Those are some of the efficacy right. issues besides the justice issue. Another very, very important uh, reason to have DE and I are the discrepancies, the health inequities that are just absolutely unacceptable. Unacceptable anywhere in the world, but especially in the richest country in the world, where in the city that, uh, that I live in, Washington, D.C., our nation's capital, Across town, the differences in life expectancy can be over a decade, just going from one ward, one neighborhood in Washington to another. And uh, the things that contribute to that are now referred to by the uh, leaders in the field as vital conditions for health. Um, we've been referring to them in general as social, uh, social determinants of health. Um, and either whether you call them social determinants or vital conditions, it starts but doesn't end with the uh, access to high quality health care, mm -hmm. but other things that are necessary to have a chance to get to the starting line lined up together so we all have a chance for health equity. And that uh, means uh, humane housing, mm -hmm. uh, safe and uh, reliable food source, mm -hmm. healthy food source, mm -hmm. uh, and many other things, including climate change, including a healthy climate. And uh, we just haven't done as good a job, and again, I take it on my generation, of focusing on those determinants, which research suggests are more potent as determinants of health than genetics alone or than healthcare alone. Obviously, we need all of these things to work together, but we haven't paid enough attention. So I think for all those reasons, it's important. And there are two actions, two sets of actions necessary to begin to set things right. One is to aggressively and successfully recruit a diverse workforce, diverse medical school classes, nursing classes, all the health professions. Mm -hmm. And secondly, ensure that the climate into which these folks are being brought is going to be conducive to them having success sure. and sure. feeling that they actually belong. And so we have a big, big hill to climb, uh, a big learning curve, and just as Dr. Whalen talked about um, asking our members for guidance and wisdom and asking our students for guidance and wisdom, we believe it's important to ask the people suffering the injustices for guidance and wisdom. And I think as a general precept, people suffering a problem, struggling with a problem, need to be consulted. And as the current term goes, to co-create a solution to the problem. And so we've added, as part of the strategic plan, a fourth leg of the stool mm -hmm. to the traditional tripartite missions of education, research, and patient care. We've added community collaborations, right. which means listening to, learning from the community, mm -hmm. bi-directional uh, transfer of information. All these things go into the rationale for why 
DEI is, is so critical and will be for a long time. Let, let, let me try to, to process or digest what you just told us here. So in essence, uh, you talked about concordance between patient and physician as being critical for excellent outcome, or at least that seems to favor a better outcome. Uh, you talked about the need to recruit a diverse workforce in part because that's a good thing and, and we want to make sure that there is ultimately that concordance, but you also talked about uh, the need for the diverse workforce to, to succeed in medical school, so, so to feel included. So, so if I were to balance it all out, I guess balance this equation, so it's diversity plus inclusion uh, will hopefully lead to better health outcomes. So it will lead to health equity, which I know at the end of the day is what it's all about, uh, making sure we have the best possible outcomes for all of our patients. Yes, just perfectly put, perfectly put. I, I'm, I'm, I've been paying attention to you, that's, <laughs> that's all. Um, so this week, uh, the Supreme Court heard some cases um, that uh, could potentially derail more than 40 years of precedence as far as the ability to ensure that we have a diverse workforce, a diverse body of students uh, can enter our, our colleges and ultimately our medical schools. Uh, so clearly there is a threat to the whole concept of affirmative action and I wish there were a better term that to refer to it because uh, those, those terms tend to evoke all sorts of feelings, but, but that notwithstanding. Um, what would happen to this notion that diversity plus inclusion equals health equity uh, if the Supreme Court were to reverse the notion that race ought to be one of the many factors that we consider when we decide to admit a student to college or medical school. So please, both of you can, can crack at it. Thank you. So um, I was uh, uh, just starting uh, my first university uh, presidency uh, when the, the Grutter versus Bollinger case came out. Mm -hmm. uh, Bollinger was the president of Columbia University and uh, someone I had the privilege to work with. And uh, the decision in that case, which is what would be potentially overruled, and I have to say potentially because all we heard were the arguments, and we probably won't get a decision until sometime in the spring of the new calendar year, maybe even as late as June. Um, the idea was to uh, utilize race as only one factor. Sure. And um, if I can make a, a, a slight uh, tweak to what you said, you said a main factor. It didn't even say that. Yeah. It just said one factor among many mm -hmm. to fit into the term that's uh, used by experts like Dr. Whalen is holistic admissions. Right. And the question will be, uh, if I could restate it, um, to match my own concern, if we take away that one aspect of holistic admissions, what will likely happen? And we have a natural experiment mm -hmm. in states in the United States that have, in fact, uh, made that uh, not possible uh, to do in state institutions right. in those states. And the initial data suggests that the rate of uh, bringing in more diverse classes reverses mm -hmm. and goes in the wrong direction. Right. And uh, one can always say, well, in, these are a California, few states, uh, Michigan, example. others, mm -hmm. uh, may maybe there's a way to do it better. But I'm actually terrified, and that's mm -hmm. not an exaggeration, mm -hmm. that that's what will happen to us nationwide. Mm -hmm. Now, there's many out outcomes that could uh, result. Um, the last thing from a legal scholar, even though I have a, um, an honorary law degree, um, it doesn't really help me too much in this case. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> and uh, one possible outcome is that the whole thing is overturned. Mm -hmm. uh, Grutter versus Bollinger is overturned. Mm -hmm. And no aspect of race can be considered. Uh, another other end of the spectrum is everything is left as it is. Mm -hmm. And somewhere in the middle, somewhere in between those, which I hope is what will happen, is that further constraints will be placed on our ability to use race, but it won't be completely overturned, and time will tell. If it turns out, even if it turns out that um, it is completely overturned and we cannot, by law, 
utilize race in any way, mm -hmm. we have to find a way mm -hmm. to continue to diversify the medical school classes. Mm -hmm. We're going to follow Dr. Whalen's formula, if that happens, by bringing together and listening to people like you and others okay. who are right on the front lines of those admissions decisions. And mm -hmm. I want to reemphasize what you already said. This is all of higher education, okay. a little right. tiny sliver of which is medical school. And I want to remind our, our listeners uh, to the podcast that as of 2021, last year, uh, less than 40% of people 25 years of age and older in the U.S. have a bachelor's degree. We live in this bubble where we're surrounded by people with uh, graduate degrees and MDs and PhDs and so on and so forth. Less than 40% have a bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. So there's a great need to have a college education available to more and more people and there's a great need in that process to diversify those who have this experience, bring them on the faculty, right. get them in leadership positions. And so no matter what happens, we have to lean forward, as the expression goes, and make sure that we find a way to continue holistic admissions mm -hmm. and to diversify the future of our country. That's well said. Um, so, so Allison, continuing that uh, discussion, is one, I guess, proxy or a substitute for um, race as a factor in, in the holistic review? Would that, could it be replaced with uh, the FLY concept, first to college, low income students? It's certainly one of the areas that we're already talking about that um, we've talked about earlier um, today with, with other colleagues. So, um, and I think what it will take will be a combination of um, creative thinking mm -hmm. and talking with the lawyers um, sure. and, and recognize that you know when something comes sure. down um, then you need to figure out what it actually means um, so that it will be a, a process but as David had said we would need to start right in we need to think hard we need to think creatively um, and and keep at it yeah. well wonderful wonderful so we've touched on a lot of uh, critical issues uh, let me ask as we get ready to close so what issues keep you up at night uh, related to the double AMC, <laughs> uh, medical education in general. So let's start with you, Alice. I'm a great sleeper. Um, <laughs> maybe because I work so hard, I'm always exhausted at the end of the day. Um, so <laughs> I think what keeps me up at night um, for the AMC is the same thing that keeps almost all of us up at night mm -hmm. um, who are involved in healthcare or involved in health professions education, which is there are so many incredible opportunities when we think about the science and how that's advancing what we can do. Mm -hmm. When we think about how actually if we do change the way we think about social determinants of health um, and have a more equitable way of taking care of our patients and the environment that we have, that we can really transform to health equity for everybody. Yeah. So that's what's the opt opt you know, optimistic side of things. Yeah. What keeps me up at night is not the fact that there's too much to do. That's exciting. That gets me up in the morning. What keeps me up at night is that there are threats right. to that from misinformation and people misinterpreting purposefully and sometimes not purposefully sure. the science for their own yeah. reasons or to really detract from things. Yeah and the amount of politicalization of things that I think have nothing to do with politics that are taking care of individuals and taking care of communities and really the um, legislative and other things that are coming into the unique space of the patient physician room um, and really interfering with that on many different levels. That's what keeps me up at night and, and really worries me. Wonderful. David? Well, um, as, as you'll know someday, both of you, with increasing age comes great wisdom and other <laughs> biological changes that keep you up at night. Um, but I'm not going to talk about those today because I really don't think your listeners want to hear about that. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, I believe that this will air after the Learn, Serve, Lead meeting. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're recording it now. You can edit this out, obviously. But... Um, my, one of the great privileges of being uh, president of the AAMC is to give a plenary talk. Right. My plenary talk is entitled, What Keeps Me Up at Night? Oh. And I'm going to talk about four issues. Mm -hmm. um, and these are personal issues. 
they're not representation of the AAMC's policies, although they tend to fit in. The first one is DEI mm -hmm. and uh, headwinds that we are facing. And uh, you and I together have faced right. some headwinds on DEI. Uh, secondly, uh, challenges the learners, struggles the learners are going through. Uh, as you know, um, Dean, um, at the last board meeting at the Board of Directors of the AAMC, we heard what I thought was a powerful recitation of learners' concerns by our voting board member and uh, two other colleagues uh, from the Organization of Student Representatives. And those three people, uh, Jen Hayashi, uh, Amel Chima, and uh, Samuel Bohr, um, told us uh, 90 minutes worth of uh, what they're concerned about. Everything from uh, financial uh, concerns right. to uh, behavioral health concerns. Yes. And a very, very great uh, concern for, for all of us and for yeah. me. Third, um, uh, to follow on uh, what Dr. Whalen was sharing, um, my concerns about our ability to advocate for our patients and their families and communities and do the right thing and maintain the physician-patient relationship that we believe is, is impossible to practice without. And um, I believe that the Dobbs decision uh, by the Supreme Court is one example where uh, whatever your point of view may be mm -hmm. about the place of abortion um, in our society, getting in the way of the doctor-patient relationship, in my view, is a very dangerous place to tread Indeed. and makes it hard for us to do what we have sworn to do, and that is to advocate for the well-being of our, of our patients. And then fourthly, also, as Dr. Whalen mentioned, I'm concerned about free speech as a general issue in our country. And um, I'm going to share some thoughts about free speech. So these are the things that are keeping me up at night. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I cannot tell you how much I really enjoyed the opportunity to talk to you today. And thanks again for being part of today's uh, podcast of Inside Humanity Medicine. Uh, our guests today were Dr. David Scorton. Uh, Can I put in a plug? Of course. One more thing. So I have the privilege of visiting many medical schools and seeing what different medical schools were doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I had the privilege to hear from you um, and actually your, um, your deans of education and faculty affairs mm -hmm. informally. Um, and really would like to commend you and let your faculty and students know if they listen or watch, um, the, some of the things that you are doing are really cutting edge. That's not a plug. Really a transdisciplinary <laughs> um, and um, really exciting to look for. So we're expecting you to present them at Learn, Serve, Lead because you're doing great work. Well, thank you so very much. <laughs> that was an unsolicited plug. Now, before you, before you go on, oh, I want no. to pile on to this party. Um, I, I want to again. You're hijacking my podcast. <laughs> Uh, well, you have uh, you have editors. You have editors. We don't have editors. Um, but uh, I also want to pile on for something that uh, Dr. Whalen mentioned earlier, and thanking you for being such a strong and effective leader for the Council of Deans. Yes. This is a position of some great, great significance for the United States, because our organization uh, includes every accredited MD granting medical school, now up to 157, and. Uh, you are doing and have done a brilliant job of that, and uh, we, everyone, uh, owe you a big debt of gratitude. Now you can go on. Yes. Well, thank you. But working <laughs> with you is quite invigorating. Uh, that's what keeps me excited, and, and, and I really love the mission um, and, and the partnership. So, so thank you, and thank you for all those kind words uh, that were unsolicited. Um, so this has been another edition of Humanity Medicine. Today's uh, guests on my podcast were Dr. David Scorton, uh, the President and CEO of the WMC, and Dr. Allison Whalen, Chief Academic Officer of the WMC. They were fabulous. See you, see, we'll see you next time. <laughs>